It's a great pleasure. I'm from the East West Psychology Department. So it's a wonderful opportunity for this department to welcome back Dr. Fritjof Capra to teach at CIIS. Today he will be giving a talk, but in fall he'll be one of our teachers. Uh, who hasn't heard of Dr. Fritjof Capra? <laughs> and I can see some people here who may have read his first book in its first edition. Uh, I was one of them. And I just learned that when I was reading it in Bombay, India, in the late 70s, uh, he mentions an experience there that he had on the beach in Santa Cruz. And in Bombay at that time, I had no way of knowing that there was a Santa Cruz in California. I thought it was the area called Santa Cruz where the airport is in Bombay. <laughs> but this is a little bit about the interconnected web of life, <laughs> which is Fritz Jobs. Well, it's the journey, the, the, the the life of Prince of Capra is a testament to the journey of a physicist, a theoretical physicist, who learned about the close connection between Eastern spirituality and physics and woke up to the integral view of life. So it's so natural for him to be here today. And today, right now, he lives in Berkeley and he runs the Capra Institute. And one of our Pardon? Capra course. Sorry, the Capra course. And the administrator of the Capra course is Mira Michelle Kennedy, a graduate from East West Psychology and an adjunct faculty in our department. So uh, I will invite Mira to introduce Fridjof and start the evening. Mira is the institute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. So it is my great, great honor to introduce you to Dr. Fritjof Capra, who I have the honor of working with as well. So Fritjof is a scientist, an educator, an activist, and an author. He is the founding director of the Center for Eco-Literacy in Berkeley. Who's aware of the Center for Eco-Literacy? They do amazing work. <coughs> They're dedicated to providing ecology and systems thinking in primary and secondary school. He is also a fellow of Schumacher College, which is an international center for ecological studies in the UK. Fritjof also serves on the Council of Earth Charter International and after receiving his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Vienna in 1966, he spent 20 years doing research in theoretical high energy physics. In addition to his research in physics and systems theory, Fritjof has been engaged in a systemic examination of the philosophical and social implications of contemporary science. His books on the subject have been acclaimed internationally and he has lectured widely in Europe, Asia, North, and South America. He's the author of several international bestsellers, as you mentioned, The Tao of Physics, <clears throat> The Turning Point, The Web of Life, The Hidden Connections, The Science of Leonardo, Learning from Leonardo, and his most recent book is the System's View of Life, A Unifying Vision, which was published by Cambridge University Press. So this, I actually brought the book tonight, if anyone wants to check it out, it's over on that table. But this is an interdisciplinary textbook that he co-authored with Pierre Luigi Luisi. And this textbook is really amazing because it explores this new conception of life that's emerging at the forefront of science. And it looks at how this new conception of life can be applied in a variety of disciplines. So it's a unified view that integrates life's biological, cognitive, social, and ecological dimensions. And at the core of this new understanding of life, we find this profound shift in metaphors, as Fritjof discusses. It's the shift from seeing the world as a machine to understanding the world as a network. 
It's called a systems view because it's about a new type of thinking. It's about thinking in terms of patterns and relationships and context. But this is really powerful because, as Fritjof shares in his book, systems thinking makes us aware that the major problems of our time, energy, economics, climate change, inequality, these are all interconnected and interrelated problems. They are systemic problems that require corresponding systemic solutions. This is why systems thinking is so important in this time. So I would also like to share that Fritjof holds honorary degrees from the University of Plymouth, the University of Messina, and the University of Vienna. He is a recipient of many other awards, including the Gold Medal of the UK System Society, the Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement and Public Intellectual Activity, the Medal of the President of the Italian Republic, the American Book Award, the Goldie Indy Fab Award, and the Benjamin Franklin Award. We are very honored to have him speak here tonight. Please help me give a warm welcome to Fritjof Kassar. Thank you, Mira, for this wonderful introduction. I, I could have gone on listening to you. you could have gone on. <laughs> it's brilliant. And thank you, Debashish, where, where did you, uh, for your kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be back at CIS after a long time and to have an even closer association soon. I, I very much appreciate that. Well, my subject uh, tonight is uh, science and spirituality and uh, let me begin uh, with a little bit of my personal story uh, which I think is appropriate since we are in a, in a very intimate setting here uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit how I, I got interested in, in uh, this subject uh, as you know as you have heard from Mira uh, I was trained as a physicist and I spent 20 years doing research in theoretical high energy physics, particle physics. And uh, from my early student years, uh, I was fascinated by the dramatic changes of concepts and ideas that occurred in physics at the beginning of the last century. At the age of 19, when I was a student in Vienna in Austria, I read about this revolutionary period in science for the first time in a book published by Werner Heisenberg around the time, in the late 50s. The book is called Physics and Philosophy. It has become a classic in the meantime. Heisenberg, one of the founders of quantum theory, describes in this book very vividly how a small group of physicists himself, Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrödinger, Max Planck, and a few others, um, were the first to explore physical phenomena involving atoms and subatomic particles, and how this brought them in contact with a strange and unexpected reality. In their struggle to grasp this new world of subatomic phenomena, these scientists became painfully aware that their basic concepts, their language, and their whole way of thinking were inadequate to describe these new phenomena. And uh, as Heisenberg describes, their problems were not merely intellectual, but amounted to an existential, an emotional, and you could say an existential crisis. <coughs> they spent struggling with this, they spent about 10 years in the 1920s uh, struggling uh, with this situation and in the end were rewarded with deep insights into the nature of matter and its relation to the human mind. Uh, quantum theory or quantum mechanics as it's also called is one of the most established and most successful <coughs> scientific theories today. Now, when I read Heisenberg's book as a young student in Vienna, I understood probably less than half of it. 
but it fascinated me and the book became my companion throughout my career. And I actually still have, have the original German paperback that I bought in maybe 57, 58, still in my library today. Mm -hmm. So this had a profound impact on my thinking. It prepared the ground for my understanding of the profound change of worldviews or paradigms that is now happening in all the sciences and throughout society. A change from the mechanistic worldview of Descartes, Galileo and Newton and Francis Bacon to a holistic and ecological view. Well, I received my PhD in theoretical physics uh, from the University of Vienna in 1966. I have a real PhD from Vienna and an honorary PhD from Vienna. <laughs> so, so after that, I spent uh, two years at the University of Paris and then moved to UC Santa Cruz. And during these next two years, uh, 68 and 69, or 69 and 70, I uh, encountered the so-called counterculture in California and experienced a profound uh, personal transformation which included a deep interest in Eastern spiritual traditions, the practice of meditation, and a strong sense of empowerment. And during that time, I had this experience that Devashish was uh, mentioning, which was not in Bombay, but in Santa Cruz, California. <laughs> uh, one afternoon in the late summer, I uh, sat on this beach in Santa Cruz in meditation. In, in those days, it was de rigueur to sit on the beach in meditation. Everybody did that. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I did one late afternoon. And, and all of a sudden, I became aware of myself, uh, of the whole environment around me being engaged in a gigantic cosmic dance. Now, as a physicist, of course, I knew that my body and the sand and the rocks and the water were made of molecules and atoms, and that these atoms vibrated. That's what heat is, vibration of, of uh, atoms. And I also knew that they exchanged particles, they created and destroyed particles. I also knew that so-called cosmic rays are continually bombarding the Earth scattering into showers of uh, subatomic particles. I knew all that, uh, but it was familiar to me from mathematical theories, diagrams, formulae, and so on. Uh, and at this moment, as I sat on that beach, my former experiences came to life. In a sense, I saw, I felt somehow these cascades of energy. I felt the atoms of my body and my environment participating in this cosmic dance of energy. And at that time, I knew that this is what the Hindus meant when they talked about Shiva Nataraja, the lord of, of the cosmic dance. Now, at that time, I had already become interested in Eastern mysticism. I had read the Bhagavad Gita, various books on Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. So I was uh, very familiar with this uh, iconography of Nataraja. And I had also been attracted to the puzzling aspects of uh, Zen Buddhism, and in particular, the particular technique of training, which is called the koan technique, the koan training in uh, Zen Buddhism. And these koans reminded me of the puzzles in quantum theory described so vividly by Heisenberg. And, and uh, one passage that I often quoted in the past from Heisenberg's book is when he describes long discussions with Niels Bohr. They were a very powerful pair, those two, Bohr and Heisenberg. And after long discussions, Heisenberg writes, I, and I, I cited that so often that I know it by heart, he writes, uh, when I went into the neighboring park after these long discussions, 
I asked myself again and again, can nature be so absurd as it appeared to us in these atomic experiments? So, so uh, the more they tried to uh, define the situation, to specify the, the, the experimental situation, the more these puzzles were standing out. And when I read about the koan training, that's exactly what is described. You go to a Zen master, and then he or she gives you a, a koan, a puzzle, and then you try to be clever and answer it, but you can't, because it needs to be answered from a different state of consciousness. And it actually is a tool to awaken a different state of consciousness, just as these experiments of the quantum physicists awakened a different state of awareness where concepts like space, time, object, cause and effect were not applicable in the classical sense and had to be radically modified. So uh, I, uh, I was already interested in these parallels between physics and, and Eastern philosophy. And then with, with this epiphany on the beach, the whole thing uh, came to life. Uh, after that, I continued to study uh, Eastern philosophies and, and mystical traditions, and I had several more experiences, but not as powerful as, as that one. But um, they all uh, gradually make me aware that uh, the worldview implied by modern physics is a coherent view that uh, is uh, very similar, has great uh, connections, great similarities with the so-called perennial philosophy of uh, mystical traditions uh, of the East and the West, but at that time I concentrated, concentrated on, on Eastern mysticism. So then eventually I summarized my findings in my first book, The Tao of Physics, which was published in London and in Berkeley in 1975, and um, which was tremendously successful beyond my wildest dreams. It is still in print in over 40 editions in, in over 20 languages around the world. Now, at first glance, it may seem strange that one would draw parallels between science and mysticism, because scientists and mystics or spiritual teachers pursue very different goals. As scientists, we try to find explanations of natural phenomena. But spiritual teachers are not so much interested in explanations, they're interested in changing a person's self or helping a person to change their self and their life. However, in these two different pursuits, both scientists and spiritual teachers are led to make statements about the nature of reality and the nature of uh, human, about human nature, and these statements can be compared. Now, before I go into more detail, I need to say a few words about religion. Because, uh, as you well know, uh, the view of science and religion as a dichotomy has a long history, especially in the Christian tradition, and has, in fact, recently been revived in several books by scientists like Stephen Jay Gould or uh, Richard Dawkins and there are others. On the other hand, so the, these authors say that, that science is incompatible with religion or, or religion is just hogwash and not to be taken seriously. Um, on the other hand, there are many scientists who see no intrinsic dichotomy between science and religion, or science and spirituality. I remember when I was uh, working in London in, in, at Imperial College in the 1970s, uh, my boss in the physics department was Abdus Salam, a very famous physicist, Nobel laureate, who was one of the leading physicists of the time, and who was Pakistani and a Muslim, 
and he had uh, Muslim praying sessions with his students, with his uh, Muslim students. He had a small group of Muslim students and they met in his home for prayer. And he also supervised their thesis. So, so he saw no, no difficulty in that at all. So I think the, the issue here is uh, that uh, Many authors fail to distinguish between spirituality and religion, and I think this is very important. So, to understand the nature of spirituality, and maybe you have heard all this before, because here you, you this is a kind of university where, where you hear these kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, to understand the nature of spirituality, it is useful to begin with the root meaning of the word spirit. And as you know, it means breath. And interestingly, the same is true for the related word anima, also for the Greek psyche, and for the uh, Sanskrit Atman. All these have a root meaning of breath. And so the ancient intuition in the East and in the West is that of spirit or soul as the breath of life. And this is what we have in common with all living beings. The breath of life nourishes us and keeps us alive. And then spirituality can be understood as a way of being that flows from a certain profound experience of reality, which is known as mystical, religious, or spiritual experience. And uh, it can be seen as an experience. It is described uh, around the world and has been described in, in various uh, times in, in the literature about mystical tradition about as a direct non-intellectual experience of reality and it can be described as an experience in a heightened state of aliveness so there's great enthusiasm there is great emotion there is their feelings of gratitude their feelings of awe and wonder it's a it's a heightened aliveness. So our spiritual moments are moments when we feel intensely alive. And uh, this aliveness, uh, which by the way, Abraham Maslow called it a peak experience. It's the same, the same uh, idea. This aliveness involves not only the body, but also the mind. And in fact, the body and mind as a unity. Buddhists refer to this heightened mental alertness as mindfulness. And they always emphasize that mindfulness is deeply rooted in the body. So the experience is always of mind and body as a unity. And not only that, it's an experience that transcends not only mind and body, the separation of mind and body, but also the separation of the I and the world. Uh, the central characteristic of a spiritual experience is a sense of profound oneness. I can share with you another such experience I had, and this was, in, just to show you that it can occur in, in various circumstances, this was in Austria while skiing. And I still, I'm, you know, I skied all, all my youth, I was a ski instructor, I, I was and still am a very good skier. And so, uh, one day I was skiing on a slope that was bathed in the sun and I was just going down in this rhythm and forgetting everything about the skis and the slope and the environment and I was just one with the total environment and especially with the rhythm of the ski. So this sense of oneness and you can have it in art, you can have it in sport, well skiing of course is a sports example that there are many, many circumstances where you can experience this. So, uh, this sense of oneness with the natural world is fully borne out by modern physics and in fact by modern science as a whole. And this is, I think, the, the main uh, link between science and spirituality is to be found in this sense of oneness. 
<coughs> but this uh, harmony between science and spirituality is not necessarily there uh, between science and religion. And so this is why it becomes important to distinguish the two. So spirituality is a way of being grounded in a certain experience of reality that is independent of historical and cultural contexts. There are descriptions all around the world that agree on the nature of the experience. Now religion is the organized attempt to understand spiritual experience, to interpret it. And once you interpret it verbally, you have to do so in a particular context, in a particular historical and cultural context. And that's what religion does. And furthermore, it uses this interpretation as the source of moral guidelines for religious communities. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, when it becomes problematic is that uh, when the mystical experience is no longer primary and the interpretation no longer secondary. In fact, very often the experience is forgotten and, and the uh, religious teachers concentrate on the interpretation and present it as the truth or as dogma and uh, anybody who doesn't believe in it or who, who questions it is called heretical and so on. So this rigid position uh, of the church and also of other religions led to the well-known conflicts between scientists and fundamentalists in, in Christianity which uh, have continued to the present day. Well, after this brief excursion into spirituality and religion, uh, let me now summarize the main thesis of my book, The Tao of Physics. My main thesis is that the approaches of physicists and mystics, even though they seem at first quite different, share some important characteristics. To begin with, their method is thoroughly empirical. Physicists derive their knowledge from experiments, mystics from meditative insights. And both are observation, and in both fields, these observations are acknowledged as the only true source of knowledge. Any interpretation is secondary and is uh, often tentative, temporary, and, and so on. Now, the objects of observation are, of course, very different in the two cases. Mystics look within and explore their consciousness at various levels, including the physical phenomena associated with the mind's embodiment. Physicists, by contrast, begin their inquiry into the essential nature of things by studying the material world. Exploring ever deeper realms of matter they become aware of the essential unity of all natural phenomena. More than that, they also realize that they themselves and their consciousness are an integral part of this unity. And so the mystics and the physicists arrive at the same conclusion, one starting from the inner world, the other from the outer world. And in this way, to me, this is a very beautiful illustration of the ancient Indian wisdom that Brahman, the ultimate reality without, is identical to Atman, the reality within. Well, a further important similarity between the ways of the physicist and the mystic, and that's actually what got me interested in this comparison, is the fact that the observations take place in realms that are inaccessible to the ordinary senses. In modern physics, these are the realms of the atomic and subatomic world. In mysticism, they are non-ordinary states of consciousness in which the everyday sensory world is transcended. In both cases, access to these non-ordinary levels of experience is possible only after long years of training within a rigorous discipline. 
If you want to know uh, how atoms interact with one another and what their structure is, you can't just look, you can't just take a magnifying glass. You have to go through years and years of training to be able to ask nature that question. <coughs> Similarly, if you want to know about levels of consciousness and, and how to transcend various levels, you need years and years of training in a, in a rigorous discipline. And interestingly, in both fields, the experts often assert that their observations defy expressions in ordinary language. They go beyond ordinary language. So, over the last 40 years, the Tao of Physics has been received with an enthusiasm that went beyond my wildest expectations. And this tremendous response has had a strong impact on my work and on my life. I have traveled widely, as Mira mentioned, lecturing to professional and lay audiences. And uh, I've written uh, several more books after the Tao of Physics. But still today, I encounter people all over the world who tell me, I love your book or your book has changed my life. And I've written you know, about 10 books, but I don't need to ask them which book they <laughs> It's always the Tao of Physics. So why is that so? Uh, why is there this strong response? Well, I've come to understand this enthusiastic reception in terms of the broader cultural content of my work. Again and again, men and women would write to me or would tell me after a lecture, you have expressed something that I have felt for a long time but wasn't quite able to put into words. These were generally not scientists or philosophers. They were people from all walks of life, business people, artists, grandmothers, teachers, farmers, nurses, all, all people from all walks of life. Quite a few have been older people, uh, and I received some very moving letters from people over 80 and sometimes even over 90. And so what did the Tao of Physics touch off in all these people? What is it they had experienced themselves? Well, I've come to realize that the recognition of the similarities between modern physics and Eastern mysticism is part of a much larger movement, a fundamental change of worldviews or paradigms in science and society, which is now happening in various fields all over the world and amounts to a profound cultural transformation. This transformation, this profound change of consciousness is what people are feeling, and this is why the Tao of Physics has struck such a responsive chord. Now, also, during many of these lectures, people would tell me that a similar change of paradigms to the one I had just described happening in physics was happening in various fields, in medicine, in agriculture, in psychology, in architecture, you, you name it. Uh, for for a while, this was maybe in the late 70s, I would sort of joke to myself, I, di I didn't say this in, in public, but I would think that people would always come up to me and say, you won't believe this, but there is a similar revolution in agriculture, forestry, <laughs> medicine, you, you name it. It's, it just, just was very, very frequent. And so that led me to explore these other fields uh, in particular biology, medicine, psychology, economics, management, and so on. Now, to connect the conceptual changes in science with the broader change of worldview and values in society, I had to go beyond physics to look for a broader conceptual framework, because physics deals with non-living matter, and these issues that I now became interested in 
health management, social justice, economics, politics, and so on, all have to do with life, with uh, <coughs> living organisms, uh, social systems, or ecosystems. And with that realization, my research interest shifted from physics to the life sciences. This was in the late 70s. And over the last 30 years, I put together this broader conceptual framework that um, I needed, and as Mira mentioned, that is known as systems thinking or systemic thinking, and I actually called it the systems view of life. It's the title of my textbook, but I used this term for the first time in my second book, The Turning Point, in 1982. So I've been talking and writing about the systems view of life for a long time. It is a framework, as Mira mentioned, that integrates the biological dimension of life with the cognitive, the social, and the ecological. And more recently, I've been uh, teaching this synthesis, as you heard, in this online course, which I called Capra course for PR reasons, so that's easy to remember. And it consists of 12 pre-recorded lectures and also includes a discussion forum online in which I participate every day during the duration of the course. We now have uh, a thousand people who have taken the course and we have a very active alumni uh, network and I really enjoy this kind of teaching. This is new for me, but I've done it now for three years and I tremendously enjoy it. Now, with my change of perspective from physics to the life sciences, I now see future elaborations of the thesis I presented in the Tao of Physics, because I'm often asked what's the next step. I don't see it so much as further elaborating the parallels between physics and mysticism, but rather in extending these parallels to other sciences. And in fact, this is already being done. After the 1975, numerous books appeared in which physicists and other scientists presented similar explorations about uh, parallels between uh, physics and mysticism. Other authors intended their inquiries beyond physics, finding similarities to Eastern thought in certain ideas about free will, death and birth, evolution, consciousness, mind, and so on. Uh, some of these explorations were initiated by Eastern spiritual teachers. The Dalai Lama, in particular, has had numerous dialogues with Western scientists in, in various contexts. The extensive, extensive explorations of the relationships between science and spirituality over the past three decades have made it evident that the sense of oneness which is a key characteristic of spiritual experience, is fully confirmed by the understanding of reality in contemporary science. And so there are numerous similarities between the worldviews of mystics and spiritual teachers, both Eastern and Western, and the holistic or systemic conception of nature that is now being developed in science. The awareness of being connected with all of nature is particularly strong in ecology. Connectedness, relationship, and interdependence are fundamental concepts of ecology. And connectedness, relationship, and belonging are also the essence of spiritual experience. I believe, therefore, that ecology, and in particular the philosophical school of deep ecology, can be an ideal bridge between science and spirituality. When we look at the world around us, we find that we're not thrown into chaos and randomness, but are part of a great order, a great symphony of life. Every molecule in our body was once part of previous bodies, living or non-living and will be part of future bodies. And in this sense, our body will not die, but will live on again and again, because life lives on. Moreover, 
we share not only life's molecules, but also its basic principles of organization. Every cell in our body is organized in a certain way, has certain metabolic pathways, which are the same as every other living cell on, on Earth. And so, indeed, we belong to the universe, and this experience of belonging can make our lives profoundly meaningful. I'll end here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. So, I would like to now welcome to the stage Marilyn Fowler, who will now be interviewing Fitchoff. And at the completion of the interview, there'll be a time for us to take questions from the audience as well. So that's kind of what we're moving into next. So uh, before, so please stand. So I would like to introduce, it's my honor to introduce Marilyn Fowler, PhD. So Marilyn has focused her academic coursework over the last 20 years on developing conscious leadership capacities and practices to foster a more sustainable world. She has been a corporate leader She's been an entrepreneurial business owner, a leadership consultant and coach, a vision quest leader, a professor and department chair. She holds a PhD from CIIS, from the East-West Psychology Department, and a master's degree in consciousness studies from John F. Kennedy University. And she was also my professor here at CIIS. So it's with great, great joy that I welcome her to the stage. So please help me give her a warm welcome. First, I'd like to invite you as well to the stage for the next portion of our evening. Let's make sure. Let's make sure all your mics work. Okay. You can you can hand you can hold it by your hand if you prefer as well. Is that working for both of you? Okay. Okay. Great. Okay, hello, Marilyn. It's a great pleasure. Well, I have to say that it is quite an honor for me to be sharing this stage with you. This. Um, this new world that we are engaged in. And I would say just to the audience that um, I first ran across Fritzot's work in 1982 with The Turning Point. And I, um, it was an assigned reading for my um, master's course at the time. And it was a big, thick textbook. It's like, uh -huh. And um, I remember I took it with me on vacation because I, I thought, well, I really do have to read this. And I opened up the first page, and I was simply mesmerized. Uh, and I read the entire book, cover to cover, and I thought, maybe someday I, I really would love to talk to, such, to this person. So here we are, some very long years later, but sometimes wishes do come true, yes? And I would also say that um, I also have been a recent student of Fritzhoff's in the cover course. And uh, I decided very much that I wanted to know much more about the scientific background of, um, of the sustainable, you know, environmental sustainability movement and um, so that I could have a bit more grounding in, you know, in that very practical and very real aspect of this. So I must tell you, I learned a great deal and I can say that the course itself, and it's not paying me to say this, by the way, <laughs> but the course itself really does cover all of the different applications in health and in leadership and in um, spirituality and you know all these and ecology and, and it's it's quite a synthesis. It's it really is a tour de force, I think, in terms of his own understanding of just how it all works. Yeah, again, then. Uh for me, it's very exciting to meet these people from around the world who then discuss things with one another. And, uh, you know, I, I remember, for instance, a, a while back, there was a, a woman who posted that she's from Argentina, but uh, she lives in Switzerland. And then another woman said, oh, I'm from Argentina too, and I live in Holland. And, and then somebody from Sweden said, 
I'm not Argentinian, but I'm married to an Argentinian. <laughs> and so it just went on and on. And then they took off in Spanish and, and you know, went their own way. But it's wonderful to see people connect in this way. All right, well, I, um, I want to ask you a question that I've been wanting to ask you for maybe 25 years. <laughs> and it has to do with your experience on the beach. And um, as I read about that, and now I've heard you talk about it, I've had this, you know, many of us in this room, I think, have had experiences, non-ordinary experiences, that are very um, transformative. And so when you had, when you could see that the universe was sort of the dance of Shiva, and that all of these particles were both inner and outer, and the experience was transcending, you know, the outer dimension as well as the inner dimension to, to create this profound sense of oneness. So my question to you is really, so how did that change you? How did it alter your sense of self or identity or your relationship with the universe or however you'd like to express that? Well, it, uh, first of all, let me say, uh, and I've thought about this for many years, but I can say quite certainly that I was not on drugs. <laughs> and I say that because I experimented a lot with psychedelics. I smoked a lot of marijuana. I took LSD and uh, peyote and psilocybin. And those, those were the years, the 1960s. But uh, whenever, at least my friends and I, Whenever we took these psychedelics, we did it communally. We never did it alone. And I know that I was alone on the beach. There was nobody there. And uh, so because of that, I know that, that you know, I was not high. I was, it was really a meditative experience. And well, the, what, what it did was really, it was an epiphany. It was really a jolt. That, that these parallels to Eastern uh, mysticism were sort of recognized intellectually. But now I really felt them. And, and I really felt a profound truth. And, and that made me dedicate a large part of my life to that. And so what happened then, when I returned to Europe, I had a two-year uh, two exchange visa to teach at UC Santa Cruz. And then I returned to Europe. And I wanted to explore these parallels, but I couldn't do it in the physics department. I was working at Imperial College. I mentioned up to Salam that was at Imperial College. But at a certain point, he said, Fritjof, I'm sorry, I cannot support this. I cannot give you a research grant for writing a book on Eastern mysticism, you know? It's not done. And so I dropped out of physics. And I went through a, a hard time financially. I taught mathematics in a girls' school, for example, uh, in London for half a year to make some money. And I did translation work. My native language is German, so I translated technical texts from English to German. It was actually quite well paid. And, and all, all that time, I was taking notes, writing articles, and writing the book. Eventually, I found my way back into physics. But it was a sort of a long sort of stretch through the desert. Now, I was not unhappy by any means, because the, the climate, the cultural atmosphere in London was fascinating. This was London in the 70s. And, and I had many very exciting friends. Uh, this is when I met uh, Adi Lang, for instance, and uh, I met the actor Terence Stamp, and you know people like that who were just sort of hanging out in various places. And it was a very exciting period, but but I had very little money. I was very poor, and uh, had to go through this. So when you say how did it change my life, it changed my life very dramatically. So I'm, I'm guessing that what you we might say that that this whole idea of oneness came, went from the, a theoretical concept to to a 
profound truth. Right, right. And that the rest of your life you've been exploring that yes. profound truth. Let, let's not forget that I was introduced to that by Werner Heisenberg in his book. He, he described very vividly that, uh, let, let me say a couple of things about this. When I talked about these puzzles, when I talked about these puzzles, at the center of these puzzles was uh, the fact that a subatomic particle, like an electron, can appear as a particle or as a wave. And uh, this is something very strange when you hear it for the first time, because a particle is concentrated in a small area. A wave is spread out. So a wave acts very different from a particle. And an electron is, in some sense, both particle and wave. And uh, I remember Heisenberg wrote that in the early days of quantum physics, they were saying, well, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, electrons behave like particles. On Thursdays and Fridays, they behave like waves. <laughs> they didn't have a clue. And eventually, they realized that this wave is a pattern of probabilities. So Heisenberg put it in the way by saying, an electron has a tendency to exist in certain places. And this tendency is spread out. It's technically known as probability. And the probability is described mathematically and has the mathematical form of a wave, like a water wave or other waves. So uh, there is a, a strange kind of reality. And then when you ask, what is it a probability of? You know, you always, when you talk about probability, probability that it rains, probability I win, might win the lottery, what's the probability of? Well, it's a probability of interconnections. And uh, a colleague of mine, Henry Stapp, of, at the University of California, uh, wrote uh, some time ago, an elementary particle is essentially a set of relationships that reach outward to other things. And then when you ask what are these other things, there are again sets of relationships. And so you never end up with any things at all. You always end up with relationships. And that's the oneness of, of quantum physics. Well, that may be, you may also now have just answered my second question, uh -huh. but let me ask you this anyway. And it has to do with the breath of life. And, um, you know, the talk, as you were talking about the breath of life and all these very um, spiritual traditions, and this sense of it's the unity of, of life, the unity of the inner and the outer. And we all understand that, I, well, I think in this room perhaps anyway, that, um, that this in a spiritual context is something that we've studied, read about, and experienced. But you also say that the sense of oneness is in, in the natural world is fully borne out by modern physics and by modern science as a whole. So is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly, the world of quantum exactly. physics. Uh, yeah, the world of relationships, which then, of course, goes on uh, to uh, the living world. If you, uh, if you go out into the forest and see a bird with you know, red or green feathers, and you ask, why are these red or green or whatever color they are, then you can say, well, there's a certain chemistry, there's certain pigments, and that's why we see those colors. But why does the bird grow these feathers? You have to know a lot about evolution, about the habitat of the bird, and so on. And the colors are an expression of the relationships of this bird with its environment. This is the science of ecology. Ecology is essentially a science of relationships. And so again, this oneness is, is there. Right, so, and I can see that you've been seeing that in various uh, other life sciences as well, and that this, that your textbook, The Systems View of Life, is actually an attempt to synthesize these very principles in four dimensions. That's right. That's right. The yes. biologic, the cognitive, yes. the social, and the scientific. And, and this took me a long time. I, uh, uh, after the Tao of Physics, I wrote The Turning Point, uh, in which I studied the paradigm shift from the mechanistic to the holistic view in biology, medicine, psychology, and economics. And 
I realized I had to go beyond physics and was looking for a new framework. I called it the system's view of life, but it was not coherent. It was just bits and pieces. Then in the next book, this was more than 10 years later, The Web of Life, published in 96, 1996, I had the beginning of a real synthesis. In the meantime, we had complexity theory, we had a lot of new discoveries, and in the web of life, I integrated the biological, the cognitive, and the ecological dimension of life. I still had left out the social dimension. And then in the next book, which was again uh, seven years later, in 2002, The Hidden Connections, I added the social dimension. After many discussions with social scientists, it was not easy, it was quite a conceptual struggle. So, so this was, took a long time. Well, so that, that's actually what I wanted you to perhaps expand on, these four dimensions that you're synthesizing. And you're talking about you know, these profound transformations of worldview, both culturally and societally. And so I'm wondering if you can say more about how those show up in each of those four dimensions. Possible. Well, the, the four dimensions are, you know, four perspectives on life, on life. If you want to understand a living organism, whether it's a microorganism or an animal or a plant or a human being, <coughs> or even a social system and an ecosystem, um, you have to understand its pattern of organization. Systems thinking is about, all about relationships and a set of relationships among the parts that is characteristic of a system is a pattern of organization. So you have to understand the pattern of organization and this understanding is a sort of abstract understanding in terms of relationships, the patterns of relationships. Then to to better understand the, the living system, you also need to understand how this pattern of organization is embodied in matter. Mm -hmm. So if you study a cell, you need to know biochemistry. If you don't know what an enzyme is, or so what DNA is, you will never understand the cell. And so the pattern of organization uh, becomes embodied in matter. So you have the pattern perspective and the perspective of matter or of form. And then the big difference between living systems, and this, this is also true for the table, for instance, you know, there's a certain set of relationships independently of the material, and then it, these relationships become embodied in wood or plastic or metal or whatever the table is made of. But in living systems, the embodiment is a continual process because there's continuous self-renewal, there's continuous recycling, there's evolution, there's uh, development, it's a continual process. And then when you, when you go to the emergence of consciousness, of mind and consciousness and, and human culture, you also have an inner world of consciousness, culture and meaning. And I call this other dimension meaning. So it's, it's a whole... Uh, uh, set of perspectives on life. I think I remember reading about that in chapter 16. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, to maybe round up this part of the conversation, um, I was particularly taken by your understanding of ecology as the bridge between spirituality and science. And I think for those of us who love the natural world, just the feeling of being in nature is simultaneously a spiritual experience and perhaps a scientific observation. And I know in my case, I go back and forth when I find myself in those environments. But, and you talk particularly about deep ecology as um, a good perceptual bridge. Now, deep ecology is, um, is a term that I read about and hear about, and it's talked about quite frequently. But I am very curious about your particular perspective on deep ecology, how you yeah, understand it. I don't know, is, is deep ecology taught anywhere here at CIS? Does anybody know? It, 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 
it should be taught because it's a, it's a very exciting philosophical school. It was founded by a Norwegian philosopher called Arne Næs in the 1970s. Arne Næs was an established philosopher. His specialty was uh, Spinoza. He was a Spinoza scholar. And then uh, he was also a mountain climber, and like many people in Norway, very out in nature and, and, and you know, very connected with nature. And so he made this distinction between deep and shallow ecology. And he said, shallow ecology sees value in the natural environment known only insofar as it is valuable for our use. So a tree is valuable to us because we can cut it down and turn it into timber and, and make furniture out of it and sell the furniture. Now, deep ecology says the tree is a living being and it is valuable in itself. And when you ask why is it valuable in itself, then, and you study the ecology of the tree, then you find out that the tree you know, gives shelter to birds, nourishes uh, you know, various uh, animals, uh, protects plants, has all kinds of what, what are now called ecosystem services. And these ecosystem services that make the tree valuable, of course, connect it with everything else. So it's valuable because of its relationships to everything else. So deep ecology doesn't see human beings as somehow above or outside of nature, but as being embedded in nature and in its relationships. And that's, of course, why it is the appropriate philosophy to the systems view. And, and uh, deep ecology is uh, very much a value-oriented. I've just talked about values. The, the defining characteristic is about values. Yes, that we are not separate from the web of life, but indeed are right. part of it. Right? Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, it's your turn. So anyone who has a question who would like um, to pose it to Fisaf, then um, do you just... like to moderate this? Or I, 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 yeah, I think I will. I'll just, yeah, great. I can do that. And then I think Mira can help with the microphones. Uh, so, um, who would like to start us off? I'll start. Yes? So, would you say the particle is part of the wave? Like, if the, part, if the particle is like a, a closed system, and the wave is a continuum, yes. is the particle part of the no, uh, th this is exactly the kind of questions those physicists <laughs> asked at the beginning. The particle is not part of the wave. The particle is a wave. The wave is an entire representation of the particle. And it is a representation of the tendency of the particle to be in a certain place at a certain time. So you, you need to realize that a wave is not necessarily just you know, one undulation. There are waves that are superposed, superimposed, and form all kinds of patterns. And the patterns give us information about the probability for finding the particle in a certain place in a certain time. Now, when you observe the particle, when you measure it, you will find it in just one place. It cannot be in two places at the same time as a particle can only be in one place. And this is known technically as the collapse of the wave function. And it's, it's still hotly debated among philosophers of quantum physics how this can be understood. But the, the point is that the, the electron has a dual nature. It appears either as a particle or as a wave. Let me give you another example, one very famous example. Uh, in those days, they would send electrons uh, through a screen with two holes. This is called the double slit experiment. And so a particle can either go through one hole or through the other hole or not go through at all and just hit the screen. A wave can go through both, both holes at the same time because it's expanded and it hits the screen 
and then each hole becomes the source for a new wave. That's a very well-known wave phenomenon. And then on the other side, you measure the electrons and they are again particles. But if you do it hundreds of times, you find a certain pattern of electrons, which is a wave pattern. So it's a very, very strange coexistence of particle nature and wave nature. Is that the same thing as sacred geometry? Mm. Not really, no, no, no. Thank you. Okay, all right, we've, uh, we've now, I think, gotten kind of approaching the deep end here. <laughs> so, uh, who else does have a question? I just wanted to say that I first saw your uh, Tower of Physics in Bombay when I was a teenager. All right. There in this bookshop. <laughs> and, uh, and I read uh, The Web of Life as well. My question to you is uh, if you, um, if the work of Nicholas Luhmann had influenced any of your writing, uh, like his ideas around social autopoiesis? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in uh, in in the textbook, The Systems Theory of Life, you will find everything I've ever written. The, the, the essential sections of all my books are, are in the textbook. But uh, you will find more about certain, uh, certain subjects in certain books. And uh, as far as Luhmann is concerned, uh, in uh, The Hidden Connections, I talk about Luhmann, where I talk about the social dimension of life. Autopoiesis that you mentioned, is a theory uh, by uh, two Chilean scientists, Maturana and Varela. Uh, the theory says that living networks are self-generating. That's what autopoiesis means, self-generation. And Niklas Luhmann was a German sociologist who applied this to society and said living networks can also be observed in, in a social situation of course, today everybody knows about social networks, which are networks of communication. And Luhmann said, just like biological networks, these uh, social networks are self-generating. So you have a communication, and it triggers ideas, thoughts, information, and triggers new communications, and very soon an entire network builds itself up. And so that's... Nick uh, Luhmann calls this social autopoiesis, and I discuss it to quite a bit in, in the Hidden Connections. Thank you. And also in the system's view. Yeah, as I said, uh, parts of all these essential uh, sections are in the, in the system's view. Yes. Yeah. All right, uh, other questions? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I work in education, and um, some of my colleagues are you know, promoting um, STEAM or STEM, science, technology, engineering, um, yeah. and um, math. Um, and I was really struck by your comment about how modern science fully confirms the oneness of us and the universe, mm -hmm. and the seeming resistance to many scientists um, to that idea. I love, I love it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not seeing it reflected in the practice of science. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've thought about this for years and years, and I've experienced it and suffered from it and, uh, you know, <laughs> Fought it, and uh, that's sort of part of my life as an activist. Uh, the the situation is that that science, as we all know, has specialized and has been organized uh, in the academic world into specialized disciplines. So, if you have a multidisciplinary approach, like I have in my Capra course and in my textbook, uh, it's difficult for a university to place it somewhere, because it applies to all the disciplines. So if you want to, uh, if you are an academic, and if you want to publish a paper and uh, uh, carve out a reputation for yourself, 
you have to publish it in a specialized journal. And if you want to teach a class, you have to teach it in a certain department. And so, uh, and if you, if, you, if you go to textbooks, you also see, you know, textbooks in uh, biochemistry and textbooks in uh, medical anthropology and, you know, specialized disciplines. And so if you now say to the academic world, hey guys, it's really all interconnected. Let's start from there. <laughs> well, if you are, if you are a 50-year-old professor who is famous for a number of textbooks, you would have to rewrite them. You don't want to do that. And so there's an intellectual investment in the fragmentation. And this is why people are fighting. And there's also, uh, in the corporate world, uh, there's also financial investment. And this is why we have not managed climate change, because the fossil fuel industry is fighting tooth and nail for their, for their investments. <coughs> so it's, it's a struggle. But I also, the good, the, I have two good pieces of, Good, two pieces of good news. And one is that with complexity and networks, people are forced to being systemic and multidisciplinary. And if you, if you tell people today networks are really important, nobody will contradict that. Mm -hmm. Or when you tell them we live in a complex world, nobody will contradict you. So these two things, complexity and networks, I think are very powerful. And the, the other piece of good news is our youth. Because our youth has, if, if you look at a 20-year-old, 25-year-old today, they have grown up in social networks <coughs> with their social media, their, their cell phones, their, <coughs> their Twitter and, and, and Facebook and Instagram and so on. <laughs> And so uh, thinking in terms of relationships is second nature to them because they think in terms of networks. <coughs> so they are born systemic thinkers and they will change the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Some of you in this audience perhaps fall in that category. Okay, questions? <coughs> Just moved from Sydney and I was driving to here and my GPS was saying, oh, next mile turn right, and then next half mile turn right, and then one part of mile turn right. As I'm used to metric systems, I was puzzled by why they didn't change yet here. Um, so, I mean, this is a minor thought of change that I was thinking, but of course you experience so much change of yourself and what you vision for it of change for the world, like what, what do you wish that could happen in the world? <coughs> well, uh, when you are a systemic thinker, and I talk about this a lot in my course and in the textbook, you realize that the outstanding characteristic of our major global problems is that they're all interconnected. None of them can be solved in isolation. But among these interconnected problems, there are some that are more serious and others that are less serious. I mean, all are serious, but some are really extremely urgent. And I think the two most urgent are climate change and economic inequality. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, our president mentioned neither of the two in his State of the Union speech, which is quite typical and really a scandal because that's what the State of the Union is. It's in extreme danger because of climate change and because of economic inequality. So my wish would be to solve these two problems and we need systemic solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, was first introduced to you in uh, 40 years ago uh -huh. uh, by a colleague at the British Museum. <coughs> uh, so I have been a close follower of decades and have found it extremely helpful, especially professionally, 
in dealing in the field of archaeomythology, the combined study of archaeology and mythology, and that the ancient is the present and the present is the ancient. There is no disconnect from that. And I wonder if you can speak to that in terms of if you have any further thoughts uh, in terms of my timeline <coughs> and my text start at 3 million BCE. And sometimes, especially with younger students, there is a difficulty uh, of trying to see that relationship and significance. And uh, NASA's courses hints deep uh, archaeology. Yeah. And, uh, He's, he's, he often brings a baseline to this query, but I would be interested in your thoughts on uh, that as well. Well, thank you for your comment. It reminds me of uh, one thing uh, that has been done several times, and that is to uh, picture the story of evolution from the emergence of the first microorganisms, the first cells, to, to today, as a timeline, and actually there have been exhibitions where you can walk through this with, with pictures, and there is now, believe it or not, an app that you can use. And this was created by uh, two friends of mine, uh, one gentleman in Santa Cruz, and it's called Deep Time. Mira probably knows more about this, and uh, the, the other one is a scientist in the UK called Stefan Harding, an ecologist at Schumacher College. And they have created this app where you can take a walk and each step corresponds to a certain number of years and then they explain how life emerged step by step. Maybe you could say something more about that. Uh, yes, so there is a deep time walk app if anyone's interested. You can get it, you download it on your phone and then um, every step, I think it's a hundred million years, and we had a Capra Course alumni gathering where a number of alumni, and we walked it along West Cliff Drive in Santa Cruz, starting from the origin of, of life all the way through to when Homo sapiens arrived. And so you walk 4.6 kilometers, which is 4.6 billion years of evolution of life on Earth, and then you see in the very last meter, that very last little bit, is when Homo sapiens show up on the scene. And it's this very um, powerful embodied experience of understanding this deeper perspective of time. So if anyone's interested, please talk to me after and I can share more information. And what is the second app? Is uh, the, uh, the Deep Time app. Time. Oh, so there's one. There's one okay. app and then what we did was um, we were walked through it by one oh, of the people okay. who organized the app. And so there are other um, ways where there'd be like, um, you could actually do the walk in person with someone yes. as well. Thank you yes. so much. Okay, I think we are at time, and um, I'd like to just thank you all for being here on such a drill, drizzly, drizzly, dreary evening. And um, but I think it was really well worth it. So thank you. Let me all tell you also that uh, Mira and I brought postcards of the Capra course. If you're interested. You could take one and ask the website on it and, and more information. And thank you all for coming. It was a pleasure to have this discussion. So thank you so much, Richard, for this wonderful presentation and the dialogue with Marilyn. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I wanted to say that you started by talking about coming to California in 1968, and that was just 50 years uh, last year. This institute began in 1968, and the California Institute of Integral Studies, the idea of integral, which is really, I believe, a paradigm shift that you're talking about, and you're looking at it in a certain way, there's a new language that has to emerge. And I think what Pritchard is doing is facilitating the emergence of that language. It takes hard work and discipline. Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, Devashish, someday, next time when we are here and dialogue, yes. we could dialogue about this very concept of integral. Exactly. This is very interesting because it's related to integration. Absolutely. And, you know, the system's view of life integrates four dimensions of life, but it's also related to integrity. 
right? Yeah. And to values and authenticity and so on. So that's a rich conversation. Absolutely. In fact, the word integral in this institute comes from a spiritual dimension, from the teacher Sri Aurobindo. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a yoga, right? yeah, and it's a psychological idea, uh -huh. psychological integration. So I think the word integral has many ramifications, yes. and I think, as you said, the time has come to yeah. create that kind of paradigm yeah. shift and an understanding that yeah. is based on that. Yeah. So shall we stay here for another hour? <laughs> <laughs> You're coming back in fall. Okay. <laughs> stay tuned for a course in fall, and then we redo our... Very good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>